We are still awaiting the outcome of the runoff in Georgia. Uh, there's plenty to talk about today other than that. Elon Musk continues to have liberal panties twisted at Twitter. We'll track the latest on what's happening there. The next liberal cash drop will probably be in the form of reparations, at least that's what they're talking about, and yet another way to divide the country and cause further harm to the economically challenged in this country. We'll take a deep dive in a way that will be unpopular with some. I think most of our audience will get it. The truth hurts. That plus the news of the day on this episode of Dale Carter's America. From the heart of flyover country, he's not on the far right, and he's certainly not on the far left. Like you, he's somewhere in the middle. This is Dale Carter's America. He's Kurt Wheeler. I'm Dale Carter, and I still have this damn cold. But I think that we're, you know, at the end of it. So I feel good. That's good. Yeah, I feel, I may sound, I think the way these colds go, when you start to feel better, you sound worse. Yeah, yeah. So I may sound worse today, but I am feeling a little bit better. It's like the, uh, I notice at the end of a cold, you always get that nasty green phlegm that always comes up. Haven't had that yet. Okay. No. Thank you for sharing that, though. Uh, Jim Crow, Georgia has had massive turnout leading up to today's actual runoff election. Now, this is a change, and we're going to probably get into this more and more with the podcast as we go forward, Um, but there are the ways that Republicans deal with things and the way that Democrats deal with things. For instance, I got a new vehicle. I got that new Mazda, right? The bomb, as we're calling it. Nice. Um, And it's got a temp tag on it. The temp tag expires on December 22nd, and I'm already freaking out. I've called Bob Watson's office. I don't know how many times, but but I've got an actual human there that I talked to, and, and we got everything set up. I, I've talked to the place where I financed it. I'm going to get my paperwork today or tomorrow, and, and I'm uneasy, Kurt, because I don't have my permanent tag situation taken care of yet. Yeah. And yet I drive by people every day who have temp tags, some of them several years old. Yeah, or no tags at all. Or, uh, yeah. you know, so I've seen, I mean, this is Kansas City, man. I've seen all kinds of crazy stuff. I've seen people with, like, their entire windshields, like, caved in. Mm-hmm. And you just clearly can't see out of the windshield. Or, you know, a door, like, half missing and stuff like that. I mean, people... People will keep driving their car until they can anymore. Well, you know, and and we'll get to Bob and and his terrific team here in just a second, but the point I want to make here is that Republicans typically like to see what the rules are, and we want to follow the rules, right? And Democrats don't. I mean, that's what it comes down to. And so in Georgia and in elections everywhere where you're going to have early voting, it's no longer about just election day. It's election season, yeah. is what we're talking about now. So Republicans are going to have to play by these new rules or we're not going to win many elections moving forward. Or we're going to have to change the rules and actually revert back to what elections should be and uh, reinstate some transparency and some legitimacy into the process because it is not right now. I mean, Well, it, I'm okay with that, but that's not what the rules state now. The rules state now that you have early voting and you have early voting periods and all that and where Republicans, I think, are missing the boat here is Democrats are far more organized than Republicans are. And so they're going out and they're getting all these people to go vote who would not vote on Election Day. Right. And but, we're not doing that. Yeah, but I mean, the, the de- it's not just that the Democrats are more organized in terms of getting out the vote, which is true. They are. But they're also changing the rules in their favor on purpose. I mean, they know that uh, early voting, mail-in ballots, they're trying to still... Uh, say that it's under the veil of this COVID thing, which everyone knows is BS. Right. And it's in favor of Democrats because you have these massive urban areas that vote overwhelmingly Democrat. People just get mail ballots. Um, you're, you have ballots that shouldn't be counted that are, that are counted. You have mailing uh, ballot machines like in Maricopa County, Arizona, that go down on election day. And then extra ballots are found in the drop boxes randomly and like a perfect number, like 200 ballots out of nowhere. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, they're they're rigging the system in their favor in, in order to perpetually win every election. They're making it so that Republicans will never win an election ever again. And that's just the, the uh, election stuff. That's not even including all of the suppression of information that's happening as well, which we're going to get into later. Well, you know, I called it Jim Crow Georgia is kind of a joke there because, you know, you had uh, Biden calling it Jim Eagle. It's just massive what they're doing there. And yet massive is what's happening to the voter turnout in Georgia. So at some point, 
somebody owes Georgia an apology because they've run the election just fine. Um, I I have very little hope that um, Herschel Walker is going to be the next senator from Georgia. I don't think there are a lot of Republicans down there that are excited about him, especially no. in the higher echelons. And again, the, the the governor Kemp, you know, he got reelected by a massive landslide and mm-hmm. couldn't pull Herschel Walker over the uh, finish line. Right. So that ought to be something that we look at as well. Let's make sure we get better candidates moving forward. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's an all inclusive approach. Uh, obviously, we need better candidates, but we also need to secure our election process and you know, uh, it's not going to happen on its own. We need to talk about it. We need to cause a fuss about it. We need to put people in power that are going to hold these processes and these people accountable because right now they're not. I mean, the, the people who are in charge, for example, of, of this Maricopa County uh, failure in Arizona are not being held accountable for anything. So um, that needs to change. And until that changes, we're on a track, as I mentioned, we're on track for Republicans never winning major elections ever again because the process is entirely rigged in favor of the Democrats. All right. On that cheery note, we do want to say hi to Bob Watson, who is our Blue Springs local State Farm agent for five decades. And again, his team, I put them through the paces when I bought this new vehicle. And they are people who I am comfortable with calling when I have any kind of a question, and they know that. Uh, they're at 7th and Main in Blue Springs, 816-229-7878. Auto, home, life, commercial insurance, licensed in both Missouri and Kansas. And I think, Kurt, you probably have companies that you deal with, I do as well, where they don't have that local presence. Mm-hmm. And you're a little intimidated about calling with any question that you might have or some issue that you want to talk about. Uh, with Bob's team, I don't have that issue. I've known them for nearly 30 years, and they've taken care of me and my family. And I just pick up the phone and I dial them, and they always have an answer for me. Yeah, it's like uh, it's like a process. You know, you call some of these places, and you're just uh, anticipating. You're like, all right, I have to put 30 minutes aside here because I'm going to be on hold, it's and terrible. then I'm going to, you know, get transferred to somebody else, and they're not going to speak English, and blah, blah, blah. absolutely <laughs> terrible. That is not the case when you deal with Bob Watson. So yeah. when you're coming up on insurance. And we're at the end of the year where maybe you might want to take a look at your homeowner's insurance. Uh, They have surprisingly great rates at State Farm, and they will take care of you. And Bob Watson's a local guy you can talk to at 816-229-7878. We love having him on the podcast. And uh, Bob Watson, so there's your insurance guy. Uh, Maybe he would insure the electric truck. I'm sure he would. Elon Musk, you know, we've talked a lot about him with Twitter. He also owns this little company called Tesla. And they are rolling out the electric semi trucks. Now, you you have an article pulled up here uh, that that speaks to it differently than the truck driver who called me on KFKF. Now, I don't know beans from applesauce mm-hmm. on uh, truck driving and and what the electric semi would do, but this guy told me that earlier versions of it would only haul fifty percent of the freight of diesel semis, requiring an eighteen hour charge after four to five uh, hundred miles of level driving. Not to mention all the other logistic questions they have about EVs. He said the eighteen hour charge time. Uh, Uh, violated their hours of uh, use that they're supposed to be out there on the roads. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you're a truck driver, uh, a big part of, and I'm not, you know, like, like you, I have very little knowledge of the industry, but uh, I would imagine that your biggest factor is time, right? Because you're trying to haul as much, as much as you can in, you know, the amount of time that you have to work. And I know that depending on um, union rules or, or rules of specific uh, contractors or companies, you know, you're only allowed to drive so much per week because they don't want to create a situation where drivers are pushing themselves past the limit and, you know, not being capable of driving, falling asleep behind the wheel, things like that. So you actually have a maximum amount that you're allowed to work per week or per uh, trip or whatever, however they measure it. So I think the the charging is probably going to be a big issue. But um, according to the article and according, I'll go back to it here, but According to the article and according to um, Elon Musk himself, they completed a 500, and this was uh, on November 26th, Tesla team just completed a 500-mile drive with a Tesla semi weighing in at 81,000 pounds. And um, just based on very surface-level research that I did, the uh, federal uh, weight limit capacity is 80,000 pounds. So it would appear that they have met the the uh, the weight limit, the federal weight limit for uh, freight, but I, I don't know. Well, we'll see where it goes. Yeah. Uh, the corollary to this is my recent purchase of my Mazda, which is a Japanese vehicle, first 
non-American vehicle I have ever owned. And it started getting me thinking about this because I see every ad for cars coming out of Detroit, Kurt, and they're pushing these EVs. They're all pushing the EVs. Yep. And it makes me wonder, you know, we talk about woke equals broke a lot on this podcast. Um, is Detroit going to get their lunch eaten by, you know, the foreign automakers? Who knows? I mean, I think the sadly, the, the public <coughs> interest for the EVs is, is pretty high as well. And even like luxury manufacturers like Lexus, Mercedes, I mean, Mercedes, the big one that they're pushing now is the EQS, which is the new... Um, all electric SUV that they have out. It's very fancy um, and looks very nice. But yeah. uh, that's the one that is, everyone seems to be pushing the, the EVs. So. Where do you charge it though? Where do you charge it along the way? If you got to, if you're going to drive to Florida, will it, do you have to build in time? You talked about building in time for talking to people, you know, who don't speak English. Um, you got to build in a lot of time for charging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You certainly do, and you have to also know where the charging stations are. I mean, nothing yeah, they're would be not worse prevalent. Than, than uh, getting stranded, you know, on the side of the highway. That's my biggest fear with this thing, you know, because um, I go back to Indiana to see the grandkids as often as I can, and that's a four, 500-mile drive. Yeah. And that's not going to happen on one charge. So, uh, I mean, do and right now when I stop for gas in, like, St. Peter's, Missouri, right outside St. Louis, um, I know that that's about a five-minute stop. Mm -hmm. Put the gas thing in, go into pee, get a drink, come back. The gas is done by then, and I'm back out on the road. Right. I don't think you could do that with this charging stuff. No, I don't think so. I mean, most of them have sort of a quick charge where it, it gets to like 50% very quickly yeah. or something like that, like within 15, 20 minutes maybe. And then to charge the rest of the way to 100%, you have to wait longer. So I don't know if the, the uh, tactic with that is you just – stop and you just charge it up to 50 percent each time and stay on the road i don't know how that who works. knows i mean these are questions nobody's asking and when you do ask these questions oh this is all settled science this is a done deal yeah you're, you're an idiot for even asking this question <laughs> of course it's all done you know yeah i mean i think initially the the goal with the evs was not for longer trips it was for like based out of your home yeah. you know that that's kind of where it started where you could charge it overnight you know you drive to work you drive to the store you know, you drive around town, you're plenty within the, the max right. uh, range of the vehicle, and then you come home and charge it at night. So this new idea of like certain states, you know, promising that they're going fully electric by a certain year, uh, it's going to be a challenge for the uh, the power grid, certainly, but then also just logistically, because it's a different kind of driving. You're not just going around and coming back home. You're yeah. driving from point A to point B over a very long distance. And it's not free either. You know, right. we talked about that. I mean, you're charging it at home. I mean, it's adding to your electric bill uh, on a grid that's powered by coal. I mean, we just keep talking about this thing over and over and over again. Right. And, uh, you know, we come to the same conclusion, I think. Uh, Senate Republicans trying to end the COVID vax mandate for the military. Given where recruitment is now, that seems like a very good idea. Update to that, Kevin McCarthy says that in the uh, defense authorization bill, which again, that's using the power of the purse that the House of Representatives has, and that is the weapon that they have in this two-to-one battle here where the Senate is uh, going to lean Democrat either way this election goes in Georgia, and they've still got the White House. The House of Representatives has the power of the purse, and he basically, over the objection of the president, said they're going to put it in the defense authorization bill to take the COVID vax mandate out. Yeah. I mean, there's no reason for it to be in there. There was never any reason in the first place, let's right. be honest. But uh, now that, you know, the, the pandemic is basically over and, uh, and, you know, say what you want about the vaccine, but I think it's certainly been exposed in a lot of ways, you know, as not being quite what everyone said it was going to be. And, uh, you know, enrollment in the military is way down. Uh, people signing up is way down. And uh, so something has to be done about that. And a lot of the good people were kicked out, too. Those people should be paid back pay. Uh, they should be reinstated and given back pay, as far as I'm concerned, well, I because hope that's I'm, just BS. I hope I'm wrong about China testing Joe Biden, which we talked about in the last episode. But if they do, this country might have to reinstate the draft. I don't know that we're going to have a big enough army yeah. to deal with what's going on over in China. So hopefully not, but uh, that's something to keep an eye on. Uh, the next thing was the uh, Biden student loan forgiveness plan hit another roadblock in the Fifth Circuit. And while it's being run up the flagpole in court, here's the other thing to keep an eye on. There are no payments being charged to anyone. 
Now, the the, the forgiveness program, you know, uh, putting it on the rest of us um, is income uh, specific, right? There are income limits on it. Right. Um, but pausing the payments with no interest being charged is for everyone with a student loan right now. Yes. My wife in particular, she has a student loan. And she she hasn't made too. a payment on it in I don't know how long. Yeah, me too. I haven't made a payment since who knows when. You know, I've almost forgotten about it, to be honest. Well, I, I doubt they've forgotten about it. Yeah. And maybe you'd like them to forgive it at some point. Um, but, you know, again, that's going to be overreach on the part of the president. And I think when it gets to the Supreme Court, which is ultimately where this is going to ha- uh, go, um, especially with a 6-3 court, 5-4 if you take Roberts out of it, um, they're not going to uphold the president's ability to do this. Yeah. And he knows it. Yeah, I think the Supreme Court would probably uh, shut it down as well. So we'll see if it gets there. I mean, they're going to keep pushing it. They're going to challenge back and forth. It's going through these other courts. So it it would seem like it's certainly headed in that direction. Supreme Court uh, hearing arguments on whether companies have to perform services for same-sex couples despite their religious belief. This is interesting to me. You know, uh, we should pause here and talk about this for a little bit because I don't think it's black and white. I don't think it's it's as cut and dry here because a, a lot of the left, they're, they're trying to um, correlate it to, um, the, you know, the, the, the lunch counters uh, during the civil rights movement that, you know, only whites could be served here and not blacks. I don't think it's like that because this lady in particular um, her business, she has worked with same-sex couples. What she is saying is you cannot compel her to do something creative to support something that she doesn't agree with. Yeah, I mean, you can't compel anyone to do anything. That's called slavery. If you if you compel somebody to create a product for you, that's slavery, literally. I mean, it's it's like the student loan thing. You, you're compelling people to pay for your student loans. You're, you can't you, you can make something, you know, you can have a right to something, but you don't have a right to demand something from somebody else. That is, uh, as soon as you bring somebody else in, it's a different story. And I think that businesses should have the right to deny service for whatever reason they want. I don't see why not. I mean, if let's take the most extreme example, right? Mm-hmm. The most extreme example, there's a business out there and it's owned by like some KKK super racist, right? And he's like, no blacks allowed in, in my coffee shop. What do you think is going to happen to him? He's going to make national news. He's going to go out of business in two weeks. I mean, and and further than that, wouldn't you want to know if if there's some guy that's not going to serve black people or whatever, or is you know not going to serve Democrats? Wouldn't you want to know that this is what what this guy's belief is and this is how he's operating his business? Because if not. He's just going under the radar. You'll never know. You'll never know what what he thinks. Well, the premise that you just laid out is illegal (laughs) based on the civil rights legislation that's on the books, federal legislation that's on the books. You cannot have a coffee shop somewhere and say no blacks are allowed here. Right. Can't happen. And I'm not sure. I guess what I'm saying, to be specific, is I'm not sure that I agree with that. I mean, I think it probably made more sense in the 1960s when that was an actual issue and there was a real cultural divide there, but that's not an issue now. And, and no, I think- it's not an issue, but the left is trying to say that that is what the issue is. They're right. like, well, what if you're a, you know, a disabled person? Right. And of course, and of and course- that's all taken care of in federal legislation. What this lady right. is saying is I have creativity on my side here. I do this stuff creatively for people. And right. you are telling me that I have to use my creativity to create something that I don't agree with. Right. Well, it, it's like every other debate, mainstream debate. Like abortion is another perfect example. The left does this every time. They take it to the most extreme example, right? And so with this, there's it's it's a, a person who has a graphic design company. She and she wants to be able to choose whether or not to create graphic designs for a gay couple or something like that. And and they immediately take it to the extreme of, oh well, what if there was some person out there who said, you know, I'm not creating, I'm not giving my product to black people. The most extreme example. Right. And they do the same with abortion. They they say, oh, well, you want to restrict abortion? What if a 13-year-old gets raped by her uncle? And, you know, what are you going to do about that? And it's like, you're just missing the point. You're missing the point. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about something very mainstream, very mild in comparison. And there's no problem with it. And and I think we, we need to start flipping it on them. You know, like I was reading uh, 
NPR comments, as I always do. And <laughs> Why? I mean, you're just trying to irritate yourself? <laughs> I love it. I love it. And they posted a story about this, and everyone was like, I can't believe, you know, that uh, – they can't just like make the cake or whatever, you know? And it's like, flip it on them. It's like, okay, you're a cake shop owner and somebody comes in and they want a cake for their Nazi reunion party. Mm -hmm. Do you have to make the cake? <laughs> you know, of well, course not. Well, these rules you do, I mean, <laughs> right? If, if, if this were upheld by the Supreme Court, you know, you could flip the other side and say, okay, um, you know, we're a Muslim bake shop and we're, we're not going to bake anything for uh, Jews. Yeah. You know, you could flip it any different way that you want Which to. Is, That's and, why it's ridiculous. And and to me, again, all of that is totally fine. People should be able to deny service for whatever reason they want. And, it, you know, again, it's just it's totally it's a power move by them, it, by by the left and by the people who are against what this woman is doing. It's a power move because, again, why would you want to take your business to her. If you're a gay couple right. and she doesn't want to gra give you a graphic design, right. go to someone else. Exactly. There's hundreds of thousands of Free people market. that can do graphic design in this country. Yeah. And 85% of them are like pro-gay. So go find another one. Yeah. It's really not that hard. you know. And you making this big of a deal out of it, it's not about your rights. It's not about equal protection under the law. It's yeah. about you being retributive against them because you disagree with what they believe in and you want to sick the government on them to force them to do what you want them to do. That's all it's about. You're making a statement is all you're doing. I will tell you that our good friend Jim Dingman at Funhouse Pizza, 50 Highway in Lee Summit, 7 Highway in Blue Springs, um, he's not going to deny you service. He's going to make you a pizza, give you a beer or whatever. A great place for the kids to hang out. I will say that there's two exceptions, knowing Jim Dingman at Funhouse Pizza as well as I do. It, whether it's legal or not, if you come in smoking a marijuana cigarette, you are out. <laughs> Don't you agree? You're yeah. out. That's not going to happen. And right, if you right. if you got your pants around your ankles. You that's know, what I was going to say. That's, if you don't you're have out. your pants up. <laughs> you're out. Because he's got a sign right outside the door. Yep. It said, pull your pants up before you come in here. So I know he's ha he's, he's got something there that's like a burr up his butt. And, and I know he detests the whole marijuana thing. So even if it's legal... Uh, you're not going to get served at Funhouse Pizza. Right, right. Other than that, you know, uh, whatever. You know, he, he loves everybody. Just come on in and bring the family to Funhouse Pizza. A couple of locations. We're glad to have them on the podcast as well. 50 Highway in Lee Summit, 7 Highway in Blue Springs. And once we get past winter and we get back to spring again, uh, I'm sure we'll do another live event. And I think it's it's uh, Lee Summit's turn, right? Uh, Yeah. All right, yep. we'll go back to Lee's Summit, and we'll have fun. Fun is what they do at Funhouse Pizza. All kinds of great drawings, too. I know he's got Chiefs tickets. He's got concert tickets. Yep. Uh, he buys all this stuff, and he buys the best seats in the house, too. Yeah, he does. And he then just, he never goes. He posted a picture here. I was kind of scrolling, but um, he says, We gave away a set of Chiefs tickets that have this view last night to this person. Uh, That's better than have... my view at Arrowhead. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're way up in the nosebleeds. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we're glad to have Jim there on the uh, podcast with us. Back to the news of the day. Um, FBI background checks for legal gun purchases. Now, I said exceeded 200000 on Black Friday. You correct me. You have the actual number from the FBI. Yeah. So according to Breitbart, numbers released Monday show that the FBI ran 192,749 national instant criminal background checks on Black Friday, All 2022. Right. So, you know, why are people buying legal guns at record numbers? And they are. Um, last week, just you know, in our own example here, Kansas City had two murders, and that now makes 2022 the second deadliest year on record with most of December to go. Yeah. And it's not just Kansas City. No. No, I have this story here from the Daily Mail. America's homicide hotspots revealed murders are spiking most in Kansas City, Detroit, and St. Louis, with the steepest rises in Democrat-run cities. Um, you can go check this out on your own. The all the ads are really annoying yeah, me. So they I'm are annoying. Go um, away from well, that. Well, you know, and, and I saw on Twitter that the Pharaoh was getting all these accolades for Kansas City being a welcoming place for the LGBTQ blah 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 plus 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 community and all that. Yeah. And I almost did it, Kurt, and I'm not doing it anymore. Because the last time I did it, I took Fallout and Slings and Arrows because he's got a huge Twitter following and they love him. Yeah. And you know what? You can have him. You want to keep voting for the guy? Vote for the guy. You want this hellhole to continue to be what it is? Keep voting for the guy because he's doing a bang-up job. 
Um, you know, I wanted to say, well, what about the fact that it's our second largest or second biggest year for murder in Kansas City? But I knew that I would be attacked after that. But that's the reality. I've actually posted uh, crime statistics uh, from the podcast page to in, on some of his posts, and it's just radio silence because there's no comeback from that. I mean, what are you supposed to say? Like, oh, that's not right. That's like fake news. Yeah, like, that's fake obviously, news. Obviously, you know. Like they they have no answer for it. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I totally get the uh, having to bite your tongue on Facebook yeah. or Twitter. Oh, I mean, I do because it's do like it God damn. I mean, do you times really want to deal with it? <laughs> you want to deal with the fallout from all of it? I just yeah. it just gets so tiring and so old. And especially after the last election that we had, they voted for Frank White again for Jackson County. Good mm. luck to you. I mean, you know, they they voted for Emmanuel Cleaver again. Good luck to you. Yep. You're going to keep getting what you're getting, and, and apparently you're okay with it. Yep. I just, I don't know. It just mind-numbing after a while. I had somewhere I was going to go with that, and I just it just went out of my head. I just, it, it, life's too short for that. Um, there is fallout from the rail strike that was settled by Congress and the president. Um, because, again, this is Democrats just, are union members, okay? And I have a lot of friends who are union members. My, my parents, my dad, my stepdad, and my mother were all in some form of a union or another. Um, so I have great respect for it. I grew up in that household. But just going in there every time and pulling the lever for Democrat mindlessly, this is what you get, okay? You, you, you wanted to go on strike because you don't like how you're being treated by the rail companies. Well, Biden looks at that and he goes, damn, if we have a rail strike... This economy, which is barely hanging on right now, is going to go off the cliff. Mm -hmm. So I can't have that. Right. Uh, we can't give you what you want, but wink, wink, I'm going to get you on the back end. Right. It's going to be okay. <laughs> right? Do you believe that with any credibility? I don't know, man. I mean, I think he's he's doing everything he can just to save face at this point. But uh, if he's doing anything at all, <sighs> I mean, he's obviously not in charge. So. I mean, you know, they, they've they've headed off a rail strike for now, and you talk about, like, the military not meeting their recruitment goals. You know, what do you think's happening in the rail industry? The reason why they're working these people so hard is because they can't give these jobs away. Right. So if you just got screwed by the White House and Congress and you have to keep working because it's a national priority – you don't have to. We don't have slavery. You pointed that out earlier. In fact, I want to note that today, as we record the podcast, is the 157th anniversary of the 13th Amendment being ratified, which outlawed slavery in this country. So we don't have slavery in this country. Um, you don't have to work for the railroad, yet that's where we are on the rail strike. You talk about saving face. How about Hakeem Jeffries? He is going to be the next House Minority Leader. The worst thing that you can be, according to the Democrats, is an election denier. Unless, of course, you're a Democrat. Uh, because Hakeem Jeffries, um, there are tweets, and, and that's the thing on these people. They, they don't understand it, or they don't care. They know you don't care because you just keep voting for them mindlessly. Um is he denied the 2016 election. He said Donald Trump would never be a legitimate president. He put it in writing. Yeah, he said he's an illegitimate president. He said he's a Russian asset. He said um, all of those things that everyone was saying at the time. I mean, Hillary Clinton was saying it. All of the mainstream media was saying it. And, uh, of course, it wasn't true. And now he's going to be minority leader. Now he, uh, he has to backtrack. And he was on ABC with uh, Stephanopoulos. Stephanopoulos over the weekend and... To Stephanopoulos' credit, he at least brought it up. I mean, he didn't really push back at all, but here's uh, here's his answer. But you, you did say that history will never accept Donald Trump as a legitimate president, and the Republicans are making quite a big issue out of that. What is your response? Well, here's the Republican playbook. Facts don't matter. What? Hypocrisy is not a constraint to their behavior. And in many cases, they believe that shamelessness is a superpower. My view Great. of the situation <laughs> has been pretty clear. I supported the certification of Donald Trump's election. Why? I attended his inauguration, even though there were many constituents and others across the country pushing me and others to do otherwise and found ways to work with the Trump administration. But you, you did say facts that don't matter. That's what he says. Facts don't matter. And yet it's the Republican know, playbook. Yeah, they'll excoriate Republicans who said anything about the 2020 election. And, and I was one of those. I didn't deny that the election took place, but I said Donald Trump should use every legal recourse he has, which he did. He went to court in every one of those states, and he followed you know, the law and, and did everything he could. Did he win? No, he didn't. 
so that makes me an election denier because I said you should follow the law and, and take all the recourse you can. Go back four years to 2016, and as to your point, Hillary Clinton, Hakeem Jeffries, and a lot of prominent Democrats said that Donald Trump would not be a legitimate president because of the whole Russian thing, which they did. Yeah. Oh, my God, this is frustrating. It is frustrating, and it, I mean, it's just another point to prove that until we sort out our elections, we really are not going to accomplish anything because Republicans are not going to win elections. With the current election process that we have, as corrupt as it is, as corrupt as the media and social media is, as much collusion as there is, you know, to use the fame, the, the popular Democrat word from 2016, between Democrats and the media, uh, there's just no possible way. I mean, unless there's just overwhelming red wave, you know, uh, in 2024, uh, there's no way that a Republican is going to win w- with what we have currently. All right. Well, I don't need um, solar panels right now to power this room because I think my blood pressure could power the room right now. Uh, but if you need it, you're thinking about it, you want to power your own house and own your utilities versus renting them, a great solution for you to consider is Austin Watterson and his team at Royal Roofing and Solar. We've got the clip up there if you're uh, following this on YouTube. If it's the audio only, write this phone number down, 816 540 7057. Set up an appointment with Austin. Have him and his team come to your house. First of all, let's take a look at your roof. If you need a new roof, these are going to be the guys who can do a great job putting that new roof on. And you may well have your house positioned in a way relative to the sun that solar makes a lot of sense for you. And Austin will explain it to you, including all the pitfalls. Uh, because he's not he's not a solar salesman. He's not going to come to your house and say, oh, yeah, solar is your thing, blah, 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 blah. What he's going to do is break it down for you and show you how your house is positioned and what solar could do for you relative to your um, utilities. Uh, it's a great conversation to have. No pressure. A guy who lives here in our town, um, he lives in Pleasant Hill, a Cass County guy. I've known him for a very long time. In fact, he did the roof at my house. 816 816- 540-7057, Austin Watterson. Maybe it's time you took control and um, owned your own utilities. 100%. All right. That's Austin. We're glad to have him on the uh, podcast as well. All right. Now the whole Twitter mess. And honestly, we could spend probably a whole hour on this, and I don't think we should. Uh, the bottom line is this. Liberals have their hair on fire because Elon Musk is running Twitter right now, and the thing that they tried to suppress during the 2020 election, which was the Hunter Biden laptop and its ties to Joe Biden and foreign powers, which to me, that's the interesting thing here. What does Joe get out of all of this? What are the connections to the president of the United States? And is he compromised by China of all places? Um, That's the question uh, that we need to to have answered. Um, and, And I don't know that that this is all going to answer it, but but certainly it's all out there, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it's not just the Hunter Biden laptop story. I mean, it's it's as I mentioned before, it's a general collusion between the Democrats and the media and social media. And a big part of this leak that that came out, um, you know, the the Twitter files, as they've been called, um, which was a series of reports and documents that Elon Musk gave to this guy Matt Taibbi, who's a journalist, and he. Right came out with everything, was showing that, for example, the Biden team leading up to the 2020 election, Saturday, October 24, 2020, more to review from the Biden team with a list of tweets to take down. And uh, it was apparently not Jack Dorsey, who was the CEO at the time. It was uh, this other lady, Vijaya Gaddy, who was the chief technical officer, I believe. Right. And uh, so there was all of this effort. You can read through this on your own. Please do, because it's too much to read on the podcast. But um, there was all this effort in order to influence the election, take down the Hunter Biden story, uh, suppress people like Kayleigh McEnany who were tweeting about it and, uh, you know, restrict their accounts. Um, 
sending lists of accounts and tweets to take down for quote unquote misinformation, which we all just know means uh, anything that the Democrats don't like. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and much, much more. So it's, it's all very shocking information. And it goes to show that it's not just about the election, which it is. It is about the election. It is about the rules of the election, which need to be changed. But it's also about the leftist control over the media, over the narrative, over the culture, and that obviously has ramifications. It's it's obviously going to trickle down into politics where you have people who are playing favorites, suppressing certain information, boosting other information in order to uh, you know protect their, their political well, allies. Some of the interesting things that came out of this, um, they said both sides were doing it, that um, the Trump campaign requested certain things be taken down and the Biden campaign requested things taken down. But the culture at Twitter was so one-sided that it was a lot easier for the Biden campaign to get things done than the Trump campaign to get things done. Right. Right? Yeah. And you can look here. I mean, this was a, a reply to sort of this whole thing. You can see employee donations to midterm candidates by party. And it breaks down all of these big uh, tech companies. I see a lot of blue. You see a lot of blue. I mean, Netflix is at the top. 99.6% of donations to Democrats in the midterm election. Right. Twitter, 987 uh, Airbnb, 97.8. Apple, 97.5. And you go down Facebook, 94.5. Tesla, 93.9. Uh, and the lowest one that they have on the list here is Oracle at 66.1. Obviously, these are not all the big tech companies in the country, but it goes to show, I mean, a lot of these are very major companies. Twitter in particular, which is what we're talking about right now, uh, they are obviously biased and they're obviously, you know, they have the power to restrict whatever accounts they want. We know that they're not applying the rules le uh, evenly, you know, uh, in terms of who they're banning for, right. for what speech, um, because they'll ban, you know, somebody for misgendering somebody, but then they won't ban somebody for making death threat, death threats against conservatives, or, you know, they'll leave up uh, Al Qaeda and all kinds of stuff like that. So it's obviously not uh, even handed. Well, and the interesting thing as well is that um, Elon Musk, who was a darling to the liberals, Kind of like Donald Trump was a darling to the liberals until, you know, he crossed them. Right. It's like, you cross me and you're, you're going to get it. Um, and now Elon Musk, it's like they, they are calling him names that are just uh, – pull that slide up and, and read that slide. Yeah, so uh, if you're watching on YouTube, here's a picture of Matt Taibbi, the – the guy. So again, Elon had the files uh, from Twitter, the internal communications and things like that. And then he gave them over to this guy, Matt Taibbi, to release them, basically. And uh, we have all of these really great responses, but this one in particular from a blue check mark. Matt Taibbi, what sad, disgraceful downfall. I swear, kids, he did, a good, he did good work back in the day. Should be cautionary tale for everyone. Selling your soul for the richest white nationalist on earth. Well, he'll eat well for the rest of his life, I guess. But is it worth it? Yeah. I mean, And you read that and you're like, wait, the richest white nationalist on earth. Who could he possibly be talking about? He's talking about Elon Musk. <laughs> right. The liberal of uh, the darling of the liberals until, you know, he he basically had the temerity to spend, what, 40 billion dollars on Twitter and then, you know, say, we're going to tell the truth over here. You know, the, the First Amendment matters. And I, I want to play this clip from uh, the American president with Michael Douglas. And, and I want to turn the coin here because uh, this was a liberal depiction of a president, Michael Douglas. And he had a Republican challenger, right? And the issue was Michael Douglas in this movie has a girlfriend who um, – uh, they found a picture of her from like the 60s where she was involved in a flag burning thing. And the Republican opponent wanted to make hay about that. And so the Michael Douglas character, who's the president, is lecturing about what the First Amendment means. Now, I know you, we could disagree about the flag burning thing and all that, but just get to the point about what he says about the First Amendment and speech that you defend. It's going to say you want free speech? Let's see you acknowledge a man whose words make your blood boil, who's standing center stage and advocating at the top of his lungs that which you would spend a lifetime opposing at the top of yours. You want to claim this land is a land of the free? Then the symbol of your country cannot just be a flag. The symbol also has to be one of its citizens exercising his right to burn that flag in protest. 
Okay, now let me turn that on its ear here. Okay, so liberals out there, I don't know if any of you hate listen to us, but maybe you might want to spread the word here. If you really want to defend the First Amendment, you've got to be able to defend the New York Post doing a story on a laptop that may well mean that the Democratic candidate for president is compromised. Yeah. What, you know, you, you've got to let that fly. And in, in the arena of ideas, get it all sorted out. What you're doing is you're going behind the scenes and stamping it down and letting your guy get elected and hoping that it goes away like a cat turd. Well, now, you know, because Elon Musk bought Twitter, there's light being shined on this, and that's the best disinfectant there is. Yeah, 100%. I mean, and it just goes back to what I've said so many times on this podcast, which is that for the left, the ends justify the means. Free speech to them just means, you know, the ability to say what they want <laughs> about anyone. Uh, but that doesn't apply to everyone, obviously. You know, if you're yeah. a conservative, you don't have free speech. If you're the New York Post um, posting about the Hunter Biden laptop, you don't have free speech. Everything is justified that will create uh, liberal victory. And honestly, Donald Trump is is the best thing going for the liberals and the Democrats right now. Because you talk about whataboutism. Uh, th have you seen what everybody's saying now? It's like, well, what about Donald Trump saying you should throw out the Constitution? What about that? What about that? Um, and what I would say to that, and my friend uh, Tom Becca, who is a uh, talk show host up in Omaha, used to be in Kansas City, he made that point on Facebook today. And I, again, I almost went there to say what I'm going to say on the podcast, and I didn't because I didn't want to deal with uh, slings and arrows from liberals all day long. I've got a real life and things that I like to get done. Uh, but what I'll say on the podcast is, I think what you're seeing is a softening of support from Donald Trump. If you looked at it on a scale, okay, you've got the far left and you've got the far right. Let's say the far right are the Donald Trump uh, against anybody out there, okay? He's my guy, no matter who he runs against. And you've got this side that says, never Donald Trump. I think that, you know, the, the graphic is coming over to this side, and there's softer and softer support for Donald Trump. And they're not going to make a big deal out of it. They're not going to have parades or whatever. But Trump went out there, and he said he's going to run for president again. Honestly, I, I've heard no buzz on that. Have you heard buzz on it? Not since the announcement, uh, which was like two weeks ago. Yeah, I, I just, I just don't much. think it's going to happen. So let's get to what Donald Trump said on Real Truth Social. Is that what it is? Real, Truth Social. Truth yeah. Social. Truth okay, Social. what did he say that's got their hair on fire? Okay, so he's uh, coming out about the, the Twitter leaks. So with the revelation of <laughs> massive and widespread fraud and deception in working closely with the big tech companies, the DNC and the Democrat Party, do you throw the presidential election results of 2020 out and declare the rightful winner? Or do you have a new election? A massive fraud of this type and magnitude allows for the termination of all rules, regulations, and articles, even those found in the Constitution. Our great founders did not want and would not want condone False and fraudulent elections. Yeah. So, you know, my point on that... I feel like that, my Trump is slipping a little it bit. It is, you know, yeah. because he's slipping from view. I, I think the country's tired of it. I think with the exception of, of this, again, this far... He's got a base of support, and that's never going to go away. But beyond that, I think the country is ready to move on. And we're, I mean, we're two years out from this election. We're not going backward, okay? To your point, we need to learn the lessons, fix the problems and move forward. We're not going to go back and say, okay, you know, you got us in 2020, but we're going to throw out the Constitution and we're going to uh, declare Trump the winner. That's not going to happen. What is he smoking? No, no I mean, of course it's not going to happen, but I think... But why is he saying this? Well, he's saying it because it's what's on his mind. I mean, to, <clears throat> just to, to get right to the point, but um, he, he has this thing, and I'm going to just pull it up again while we talk about it. So he has this, uh, this kind of strategy, which is like... Uh, what would you call it, like pitching the sale or, or overselling, you know, something like that, where he'll come out with this crazy thing, you know, we're going to build the wall and we're going to make Mexico pay for it. Right. And he starts at this point and then he works his way down to where he can actually make a deal uh, and get something accomplished. That's been his entire political career and his entire career as a businessman as well. He'll come out with something outrageous, you know, a, a very high goal and then he will work his way down to what actually gets implemented. And in this case, you know, obviously 
uh, he's not going to be declared the, the winner of the 2020 election. He's not going to be reinstated as president. But I do think, you know, he, ma- he makes an interesting point, which is that and, and he's not which he's not wrong about. I mean, the the, the election was rigged. And, and, and in a lot of ways, I mean, I think if you look at all of this between the rules being changed, between the unconstitutional uh, change of rules in certain states like Pennsylvania, between all of the shady stuff happening with the ballots overnight, ballot harvesting, multiple ballots from people, uh, you know, ballot mules dropping, you know, <laughs> tens or, or hundreds of ballots off in drop boxes. And then you move that to the conversation about Twitter the suppression of the Hunter Biden laptop story, which in polling immediately after the election, I think it was like 16 or 17, uh, just under 20 percent of Democrat voters said that they would have voted differently if they had known about the Hunter Biden laptop story, which was more than the margin of victory that uh, Biden won the election by. So even just based on that alone, that is clear election interference. It's clear voter suppression by the uh, by the Biden team and and by the uh, by right. the, the, so learn the, the lessons, learn the lessons, fix the problems, and move forward. I mean, you know, by by what you're talking about, we could go back and we could say that the 1960 election, you know, a bunch of dead people in Chicago voted, and that was the, you know, that that was the uh, margin that allowed JFK to win over Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon didn't try and blow up the whole system. He did the gentleman thing, and he conceded, and he came back in 1968, and he won again. Um, it, it can happen. What the country doesn't want is to go backward. The country wants to go forward. Right. And I mean, I think Trump's uh, problem is not so much that he is drawing all this attention to the 2020 election, because I think that we're seeing more and more that that criticism is legitimate and it needs to be talked about. Whether something's going to be done about it or not, I think is besides the point. You know, we need to be very clear that this happened, these things happened, so that we know that these things need to be changed for the future. You know, I agree with you. I think we need to look forward to the future, but we can't look forward and change these things if we don't know what needs to be changed and why. His problem, which he sort of does here, but he does a lot more in other posts and speeches and things, is he makes it about himself. He's like, they took it away from me. I was right. I was robbed, you know, I blah, blah, blah. And he kind of whines about it. I don't think that's very smart strategically. But I do think he's right to point it out, and I think uh, it needs to be shown a light on much more. All right. Well, let's move on to another fun subject around here, and that is reparations. I just pointed out that uh, today is the anniversary of the 13th Amendment being ratified in enough states to make it part of the Constitution. So 157 years ago, um, we decided that uh, slavery was officially not going to be a thing in the United States. 157 years. Now, by that time, Abraham Lincoln was dead and in the grave. Andrew Johnson, who was his Democrat vice president in a coalition government, had taken over as president, and the whole Reconstruction thing was a complete mess. And all of a sudden, blacks who were free found their lives worse than when they were slaves, essentially. Um, And that took until the 1960s to rectify some of that. So California has a task force. And by the way, the pharaoh here in Kansas City is on board with all this, too, as well. Oh, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Um, That uh, black Californian descendants of slaves are owed $220,000 per person. And given the black population of California, that comes in at $569 billion, with a B. A lot of money. Yeah. No idea where it's going to come from. I mean, I think the pharaoh is, is saying that we should have some sort of a tax and that that money should go somehow. I don't even know how you would do all this, but I did a little bit of math, um, and, and I used the old internet there, so who knows whether it's true or not. But the, fact, the figures I came up with, 46.8 million Americans identify as black. You got it's not, Identify. It's not, uh, that's exactly how it was put, too. Identify as black. Okay. Well, shit. If we're getting reparations, maybe I identify as black too. I'll go. I'll do a DNA test. I've got like you know probably 03 percent somewhere. Yeah. Forty one percent of the forty six point eight million trace their lineage back to slaves. I guess we take their word for it. Yeah. I, guess. I mean, I, I don't know, but forty one percent. Okay, so two hundred twenty three thousand per 
comes out to $4.27 trillion. Mm -hmm. Now, my calculator wouldn't go that far, but I think that's the right number. Okay, so I have three questions. Why would we do this? How would we do this? And will it ever be enough? No, no, and no. <laughs> well, why would we do this? Um, I, I, I just don't know. I mean, you know, th- there are some people out there saying that, you know, because um, uh, housing restrictions and covenants were put in place. In fact, uh, the first house I ever bought in Indiana uh, was in a near downtown area, and it was built in the 1920s, and it had in its title a covenant that said it could not be sold to African Americans. Now, that was changed with civil rights actions in the 1960s, but, you know, in the 1920s when they built the house, that was in the title that you can't sell it to African Americans. Um, And there are those who say that because of those restrictions in housing and other things that, you know, we owe them something. And do you agree with that? Absolutely not. I I think that, you know, (laughs) what I was going to get to out of all of this is – you know, the question, what has the Democrat Party done for blacks other than make their life worse? Well, they've been throwing money at the problem for 100 years now. And exactly. It clearly hasn't fixed the problem. The great society that LBJ put into place in the 1960s, I would argue, made life worse for blacks, certainly didn't make it better, um, destroyed the black family. And, you know, can you point to any federal program that was put in place that helped? to get a ladder up. And I yeah. think that's what Republicans need to sell is we're here with opportunity. We want you to do well. We want your life to be better. Yeah. It's it's the inconvenient truth of this whole thing. And, and we can talk about why it's a stupid idea. We can talk about why grievance politics is wrong, and it is, and we've talked about it many times. And we can talk about all of these other theoretical sort of political things. But The sad truth of it is I think the bottom line is that if we were to actually do this and we were to give, you know, whatever it is, $200,000 to every individual, would it really change anything? Would would these people really, well, you know what it would do with some exceptions, I'm sure many would, but you know, would, would people who are really struggling, who have, who have been given all of this welfare already and have not gotten out of the hood i mean are they really going to do anything different i I don't believe that they will and that's maybe that's cynical on my part but i don't think it's really i think you have the election to back you up because again emmanuel cleaver overwhelmingly voted in by the fifth district of missouri yeah frank white overwhelmingly elected as the county executive of jackson county apparently there's not enough people out there that say hey maybe we ought to try something different after all these years yeah, uh, th- there's just not. And then, it, of course, I mean, it's just it's a stupid idea to begin with. It's it's purely race baiting. I mean, it's going to divide the country f- far more than it already is, which is a lot. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you have the, the logistical quandary of who pays for it to whom. Uh, where does the money come from and all this stuff? I mean, Barack Obama is the perfect example. Barack Obama is a black American. But he's not descendant from slaves. His his uh, his dad is Kenyan, right? Uh, and his mom is white. And on his mom's side, if you go back far enough, I think his great 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 grandfather on his white mom's side was a slave owner. So Barack Obama, the first American black president, is he going to owe reparations? Because if you actually follow his lineage, he comes from a slave own a uh, slave owning family. So should he pay reparations or should he receive reparations? Well, and you just mentioned that for some people, two hundred twenty-seven bucks or two hundred twenty-seven thousand dollars, two hundred twenty-three thousand dollars would would make a big difference. If you add another four point two seven trillion dollars in funny money to this economy, what's that going to do to inflation? That's already staggering, right? So th- there's no reason to do it unless you're invested in keeping black communities down. Here's the unpopular thing I'm going to say here in certain quarters: see Sharpton and Jackson. They are invested in keeping black people exactly where they are. Yeah, they're invested in keeping uh, the black vote as a uh, as like a toy that they can manipulate and use. Take it for they, granted. They use the they use, and this is unpopular too. But uh, the the left, broadly speaking, again, I'm I'm painting with broad brushes here, but they see the black population as essentially like toys or pets that they can manipulate because they are like, oh yeah, you're so. Uh, you're so 
oppressed and there's nothing you can do about it. And only we can help you. Only we can give you the money, you know, from the government that you need. You can't control anything on your own. They're, it's the, the soft bigotry of low expectations. They're perpetuating this idea that everything is because of slavery. Everything is because of the evil white man. And you can't do anything on your own. You can't improve your own lot in life. And even if you're a drug addicted single mother with three jobs, it's not your fault. It's because, you know, society is against you. And here, take this $200,000 and keep voting for Democrats for the rest of your life. That's what it's about. Well, what are Republicans going to do? Here, I mean, I, I would give you some examples of what Republicans could do. Fix crime, for one thing. Mm -hmm. If I lived in a black community, I would be on the phone to the mayor every day. What are you doing about crime? Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're, they're going to interview a new police chief this Saturday. There's three candidates for it. Uh, one comes from the New Jersey State Police. One comes from Philadelphia, your hometown, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and one is with the Kansas City Police Department right now. I'd rule that guy out because it's been <laughs> yeah. a complete disaster. <laughs> right. I'd bring in somebody new. And then well, I want to know. Philly's not doing great either. So uh, what are you going to do about either. crime? What are you? Because that is one of the things that's holding back these communities. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do for economic uh, advance? here. And, you know, uh, Tim Scott out of South Carolina uh, had some great ideas for how to do that. Enterprise zones. Who's talking about enterprise zones? They're not. I mean, they're, they're saying, you know, elect us, we'll give you more money, we'll give you this check, and yada, 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 and your life will be great. And it's not. And yet they keep voting for the same damn people. Yeah. It's because it's very hard to pitch an alternative, you know, and, uh, and I talk to people about this all the time. And, and it's like, how do you sell somebody that there's nothing you can do for them? How do you how do you sell to somebody that the answer is not for me to give you something, that you have to get it for yourself? It's very hard to sell that to somebody in, in any capacity. It's not just politics. It's yeah. it's a it's a job. It's, um, you know, you know what you buy, like, you know, retail. I mean, it, it applies to anything. You have to sell people that they have ownership and responsibility over their own success in life and there's nothing you can do about it and uh i didn't know if you wanted to watch the reagan clip or not, i do but. actually because here's a guy who was a great president i mean you know there are people who would argue that uh, but the 40th president of our country especially with the overwhelming re-election he got in 1984 and, you know, there are those that say Republicans don't care about what happens in the black community. Ronald Reagan actually went to the black community and tried to make a difference, and they wouldn't even let him talk. Yeah. This is in 1980 uh, in the campaign, so he's not president yet. Okay. So this clip goes on for 20 minutes, but he's so he's in the South Bronx, and in the beginning, somewhere in the beginning of the clip, they show like him driving through the South Bronx, yeah. and it's just like yeah, like here, it's just like completely decrepit, completely broken down. Yeah. to turn off the sound and he goes to talk to these people and they don't want to hear what he has to say i mean they're shouting him down for literally 20 straight minutes he's trying to go present his platform and they're like what are you going to do for me what are you going to do for me shouting at him you know and and finally he kind of breaks if you watch the whole thing towards the end he there's one woman in particular that keeps shouting at him and he kind of breaks and he's like, I'm trying to tell you, I'm trying to tell right. you. And then CBS, uh, I think it was CBS, maybe ABC, they ran a one minute story in 1980. They ran a one minute story on this and they clip out that one section of him yelling at the lady and that that's what they play. And so the broader point here that I think is relevant is that, you know, you can only help people if they want to be helped, uh, if they're going to accept the message that you're trying to give them. And if they're not, then I mean... But what are you supposed to do? I mean, yeah. I, I think there's something that has to be done. I mean, obviously, Republicans need to be much better at messaging um, towards the inner cities in particular, but it's a very tall task, and, and somebody's got to figure out a well, way to do it. It's easier to get goodies from the government than it is to, as you said, have responsibility. And, you know, a big part of Reagan's platform was cutting tax rates so that taxpayers, the people who fund all this, could keep more of their money and reinvest it in the economy. 
And, you know, people like Biden will say, well, it's been debunked, trickle down economics. It doesn't work, doesn't work. Um, so th- this is really the big divide in this country. If we get past all the other crap out there, the big divide in this country is what is the role of the federal government? Is the role of the federal government to basically fleece as many people who want to work for a living for their tax money so that it can be redistributed in ways that will never affect this country in a positive way? That's the Democrat way. The Republican way is let's cut taxes, let's cut the size of government, and let's build up our communities on the private sector side because that's what wins. That's what turns communities like what you're seeing on there into flourishing communities rather than the hell holes that we have. Yeah. It's a tall order. Tall order. And, you know, it's, it's a tough sell, but at some point we're going to have to do it or we're going to continue to, com- to fall as a country, and I hate to see that. I really do. Yep. And Bob Watson hates to see it too. And that's why he talks to us a lot about what we're doing here on the podcast. Because even a guy who has been around for five decades serving folks in Blue Springs and the greater Kansas City metro area with insurance for five decades, even a guy like Bob Watson still cares about the future of this country. He's got kids, he's got grandkids, as I do. And you want to see the country do well because you want them to do well. And that's why Bob's a great guy to carry your insurance. Whether it's your car, your home, your life, your commercial insurance, if you've got a business, Bob Watson's the guy. And State Farm has surprisingly great rates. Check him out at 816-229-7878. 816-229-7878. He's at 7th and Main in Blue Springs. He's licensed in both states and can help you with all of your insurance needs. And again, he has a fantastic team. Uh, Terry Drummond on his team has held my hand through the purchase of this new vehicle, and they'll do the same thing for you. You have any question, regardless of what it is about insurance. In fact, um, I ran the purchase by Bob before I did it, Kurt, and and he was telling me how great that car does. Mm-hmm. And if you if you want to get something that's going to be safe for your family, trust me, your State Farm agent like Bob Watson knows what the safe cars are out there. In fact, I think he told me his daughter has one. Mm. So check it out. If you need insurance, great time to check your homeowner's policy and uh, maybe get a better rate at State Farm, 816-229-7878. We will leave you with this. This country, it's all about get rich quick, right? Anybody can sue anybody for anything. Have I told you the story, Kurt, about what happened to me when I was 16? Uh, depends on which story uh, well, about when you were 16. The one where I almost died. Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. So I'm 16, and I hurt my knee playing sports, and I also had a cold at the time, much like I have today. So I go to my doctor, and he prescribes something that now you can get over the counter, but back then you had to get with a prescription. Either his handwriting was bad or the pharmacist got something wrong. So instead of cold medication, they gave me um, blood pressure pills. And instead of taking the blood pressure medication one time per day, as you would for that, and I didn't need it then, um, they had it down for four times a day. So I'm taking this stuff four times a day. It's not helping my cold, but it damn near killed me. You know, uh, we only had one bathroom in our house. I remember I lived in the basement. So here I am going to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. I hobble up the steps because my knee is blown, right? I get to the bathroom, do what I got to do, turn around, and I passed out. Mm. had a near-death experience. I could see the whole scene unfolding from above, right? Mm. That's weird. Yeah. And my parents rushed me to the hospital, and uh, my stepfather was a policeman, so um, the um, FOP attorney was there. My doctor came in, and, man, you talk about somebody with no color. That was my doctor. Mm -hmm. Uh, They revived me, and and I I lived. And the story, the reason I bring that up is because the FOP attorney told my stepfather, well, if he died, maybe you might have a case. (laughs) Can you imagine that happening today? No, no, Uh, you'd get sued right away. (laughs) Exactly. Okay, so from the people who brought you suing Kraft Macaroni and Cheese because they say it takes longer to make than the package suggests, that is a true court case right now. There is a federal court taking TGI Fridays off of a lawsuit filed because their mozzarella sticks are actually made with cheddar cheese. Now, why is TGI Fridays getting off this multi-million dollar lawsuit? They don't make them. Because, yeah, they just have them freeze, they just sell them. freeze freezer packed and then... That's it. So yeah. the suit will continue against InVenture Foods, the maker of the cheese sticks. 
That goes forward. So it's possible that somebody's going to get a real big payday because TGI Friday's Mozzarella sticks are not really made out of mozzarella. So look very closely at all of the uh, the labels and the ingredients on everything that is called something like mozzarella exactly. sticks. So and you may get a big payday yourself. The advice as we leave you on this episode of Dale Carter's America, you can either work hard, live on less than you make, and save for retirement earlier than you ever thought you needed to, or you can find a really good lawsuit and sue the shit out of somebody <laughs> and make a lot of money. Your choice. Or you could buy Powerball tickets. Whatever works for you. Until next week, this is Dale Carter's America. The views expressed on Dale Carter's America are Dale's and Kurt Wheeler's. They do not necessarily reflect the views of KFKF or Steel City Media. Comments can be sent to dalecartersamerica at gmail.com. Check back for weekly episodes. Subscribe, spread the word, and give us a five-star review. Thanks for being a part of Dale Carter's America. 